you know, there's only one way we're going to solve this little problem. I hear that you've been causing trouble again. You've been stirring up things. You've been hurting innocent people. You're bad. I'm good. No matter what happens today, everybody will know that I win and you lose. Because that's the way it works. So what's it going to be? You going to head on out of these parts? You going to change your ways? Or are you going to prove you're that low down sack of good for nothing that you really are? Go ahead. I dare you. Ba 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 ba. Now we all know. Sunshine and roses. Here on out, because that's the way it works. I don't know, maybe I missed my calling. <laughs> I did grow up in Arizona, that's how we resolve problems out there. It's still the Wild West. Did that sound familiar? Maybe a cartoonish, maybe not a cartoonish view of how things tend to work, especially in the movies that we see. You know, it's interesting. We're going to break down the myth of violent redemption today. And that's exactly what that portrayed. It is, it's interesting that as you listen to it, I'm going to ask you to do a lot of heavy listening today, because there is a lot that I want to pack into the next 20 minutes or so, so buckle up. It's interesting, though, that this is week three, and we've talked already about uh, theologies that might not be so traditional. I'm going to talk today about what is a very traditional theology, and I guarantee you I will get more pushback on today's sermon than we will have on the previous two, which is fascinating, something to think about as we dig in here. So think about the movies that you've seen. Think about the movies that you see trailers for uh, on television, anything you're watching Think back to some of your favorite movies, maybe stuff like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. A even animated Disney movies like The Lion King, science fiction movies like The Matrix, or even Lifetime movies. I haven't seen a lot of those personally, but there's one key plot line that almost all these movies, all of them if they're action movies, follow through on. It's that in the end, the bad guy has to die. The bad guy must be vanquished. And this bad guy is usually a one-dimensional character, all bad. Nothing good about him. So bear with me for a moment. Does this plot line sound familiar? And I'm going to stick, because this, this is very male-centric, because that's the way it usually goes. Here it goes. Bad guy comes to town, and bad guy is rotten to the very core. Evil through and through. There is nothing good about this individual. Bad guy harms innocent people for the sake of greed or power or maybe just plain nastiness. Good guy, usually slightly flawed but good-hearted individual, initially refuses to get involved, right? He suggests there must be another way that this problem can be solved. But bad guy continues to ravage innocent people and or confronts good guy. And that finally coaxes the good guy into a showdown. The final battle scene or fight scene, the showdown must be violent. It has to be. There's no other way. And there can only be one survivor. We know how this ends, right? Good, guilt, good guy kills bad guy, taking violent action against said bad guy. Usually after the bad guy draws first so the good guy can claim self-defense. And everybody lives happily ever after. All problems are solved. Order is brought to chaos. Popeye pounds Bluto into submission. Oh, I forgot some of my best slides. I pretty much looked exactly like that, didn't I? <laughs> Popeye pounds Bluto into submission. Neo, the Christ-like figure in the Matrix, beats Agent Smith and his minions. And of course, Iron Man defeats Thanos 
and the highest grossing movie of all times. Hmm. And here's the thing. It feels so good, doesn't it? To see the bad guy get his in the end, it makes us feel better. But we're being taught in every episode, every movie, every comic, that violence is the way that leads to peace. That violence will bring order out of chaos. But if that's true, if violence leads to peace and order, I wonder why the world is not at peace. Food for thought. And fairness, the idea that violence is our salvation, that violence can bring order to chaos, and that violence is the path to peace, is as old as human history itself. It's called the myth of redemptive violence. Violence saves us, is what this myth says. So I mentioned that this myth is as old as time. One of the scriptures listed in today's bulletin is the Enuma Elish. Don't worry if you couldn't find that in your Bible. It's not in your Bible. But it is one of the oldest documents in human history. It was written in Old Babylon on seven clay tablets. It's not in our Bible, but there are many similarities to our Bible. It contains many of the same myths that our Bible is built upon as well. One myth that's in there that is quite different, though, is a creation myth. See if this sounds familiar to you based on what we just talked about with movies. In this myth, before creation itself, there were two gods, Tiamat and Apsu. They begat younger gods who began to create a real ruckus to the degree that mom and dad, Tiamat and Apsu, couldn't get any sleep. No matter how much the folks pleaded, the kids just kept raising a ruckus. So, Parents do what any good parent would do. They decide that they need to kill their kids in order to get some good peace and quiet. But the kids find out about it. And Ea, the leader of these kid gods, well, they kill dad. They kill Apsu. So Tiamat, what else is there to do but seek revenge? So she begins creating beasts that will kill Ea and his brothers. Again, though, the younger gods strike first. One of these younger gods, Marduk, promises to take out Tiamat, mom, but only if the rest of the gods promise that they they will give Marduk absolute power if he's able to pull this off. He does, indeed, pull it off. He drives a wind, a hurricane-like wind, down Tiamat's throat. Then he shoots an arrow into her distended belly, striking her heart, killing her. And then if that's not enough, he takes a club and he smashes her skull. And in the final act in this gruesome tale, he takes her body and he spreads the entrails across the sky. And thus creating heaven and earth and all of the cosmos. Violence is the way here. It's the primary, it's the only method to resolve problems. Power is gained through violence. Creation itself was an act of violence. Therefore, the myth asserts, if you follow it through, The only way that the world can be redeemed and renewed is also, what? Through violence. For centuries, Babylonian priests and kings would reenact this gruesome legend as a way to reinforce the king's power, a violent power. So, as Walter Wink puts it, theologian and biblical scholar of whom we rely on for a lot of this theory of of the myth of redemptive violence, he says it this way. He says, quote, Humanity is created, created from the blood of a murdered God. Our very origin is violence. Killing is in our blood, unquote, according to this Babylonian myth. We didn't invent the evil, but that's just the way the world works. The myth of redemptive violence through and through. Here's the deal, though. 
It's not what we read in our creation myth. The Bible that is in your pews is diametrically opposed to this from the very beginning. Whereas the Babylonians thought evil predated good and the universe was created through an act of violence, Genesis begins with a chaotic world brought into order by God and it's punctuated in a different way. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together God called seas and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let there be light and there was light and God saw that the light was good. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind, and God saw that it was good. God saw everything that God had made, and indeed, it was very good. In this creation story, good precedes evil. Order comes from a benevolent and loving God, not a violent act of revenge. But still, that draw of redemptive violence is such a strong one. And we see that even in our Bibles, redemptive violence can become the order of the day. David slays Goliath. Pharaoh and his army are destroyed by an act of God in the Red Sea. Even Noah and the flood can be seen as, re- as a redemptive violence narrative. Now, it's fair to note that this was not the entirety of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. There are other stories that highlight a different way, a different path to redemption. We can think about stories like how Joseph forgave his murderous brothers, and he brought two nations together. But when we get to Jesus' arrival, and all of Jesus' teachings, and all of Jesus' life, we see that the myth of redemptive violence is not his way. That is not the way to real redemption. Romans occupied Jesus' land and people through violence, and some of Jesus' very own people were fighting a guerrilla war against these Romans. Violence, they still thought, was the way to peace, but not Jesus. And here's where it gets hard. It makes us uncomfortable. It makes us feel sometimes like we're soft or unrealistic if we want to be part of Jesus' way of redemptive salvation. Recall Jesus' first parts of ministry. He was driven into the desert. What was one of the things he was tempted with? Power to rule the world, the world's kind of power. A polite no thank you, Satan. And then as if to underscore this very concept that Jesus' way was peace We see it throughout his entire ministry, and then we get to the end of his life, and that's the scripture we're going to pick up in just a minute. We see that Jesus is again offered a way out just before he knows he's about to be executed. Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? Legions, a military term for a group of soldiers. 
No matter what you think about whether Jesus could have done it, the point is clear. The way of violent redemption would not be Jesus's. He was going to refuse to seek redemption through violence, even when faced with violence. Now, this way of peace often gets panned as impractical, as cowardly, as weak. Is Jesus cowardly? Is Jesus weak? He chose a way that led to his death. He chose a way that shows us redemption. Is it impractical to follow this path? Well, here's one of the ways I think about it. The Romans and the other religious powers of the day used violence as an end to their means. Jesus used his way of courageous, nonviolent resistance, which has lasted. There are billions of people gathering today all around the world in Jesus' name. How's the Roman Empire doing? Long gone. Yet it's stunning to see how the vast majority of Christianity has shunned and argued its way out of this obvious ethic of Jesus in the name of self-defense and so-called just war. But let's say this. Let's say for a moment that we didn't care about what is so clearly Jesus' way of nonviolent resistance. Let's say we wanted to be realistic, quote-unquote. Okay. So one of the questions that often comes up when we scrutinize Jesus' way of peace are questions like, well, what? What about Hitler? Or what would you do if somebody was holding a knife to your family's throat? Fair enough. But let's also cast scrutiny on the way of violent redemption. An example from the real world. In Afghanistan alone, We're in the 18th year of war, the longest war in U.S. history. More than $2.4 trillion have been spent on this war, basically straight to our national debt. 2,500 U.S. military personnel have died. 1,700 U.S. military contractors have died. More than 20,000 plus U.S. soldiers have been wounded. And they bring these scars back to our community hurt individuals, and hundreds of thousands of Afghans who have lost their lives. Has this made for peace? Now, I hear that the Taliban is coming to the negotiation table, and that's good. We pray for peace here. If I were a betting man, though, I wouldn't put any money on that peace negotiation. We've been here before. And even if peace talks are successful, all that money, all those lives, where are we at now versus 2001? Stalemate. Hmm. If we're going to apply the scrutiny of what were we going to do about Hitler, we need to apply the same scrutiny to other violent actions. Violence does not create peace. So, what are we good people going to do when faced with the consequences? If we don't want to fight back violently, if we want to create a peace that lasts generationally, if we really want redemption, if we really want justice, what are we going to do? First, we're going to remember that Jesus didn't just lay down, that Jesus, like I told the children in the children's story, he drove the money changers out of the temple. He showed his anger. He didn't take it lying down. And as we've discussed before, turning the other cheek is a defiant act. It's not a cowardly act. It's meant to draw out the humanity in others and the oppressor, as well as stand up to injustice. Enemy love. That's a strategic move. And it's a shield to keep ourselves from falling victim to this myth of redemptive violence. I'm not going to lie, it's hard. This is not easy, and it's contrary to everything we see in our world today. So let's look at some real-world examples. How about South, Af- South Africa fighting decades of apartheid? 
They saw that the tide was turning. The black African population could have easily sought revenge. They certainly deserved to seek revenge if they would have followed the myth of, not, of violent redemption, but they chose a different way. The truth and reconciliation counsel and process based largely on Jesus' principles. Closer to us in spirit, we mentioned it already today, as we see these images just from a couple of days ago in Nigeria. Churches, homes, hospitals, cars, burned, people killed. Our Nigerian brothers and sisters have courageously shown us a way that includes the love of enemy. This has been going on for years now. But they know. When you talk to Nigerian leaders, they know that killing Boko Haram members is not going to create a peace that is generational. In other words, if you kill a Boko Haram member tomorrow, what about their family? What about their kids? Is that going to be forgotten? Not bloody likely. They know that peace is found in another way. Now I want to close by sharing an example, another example of redemption that's found closer to home. And it's not in direct confrontation with the so-called opponent or enemy, but it is seeking a way of redemption. And it's seeking to respond to lynchings. Lynchings that happened in this country. Lynchings are the epitome of the myth of violent redemption. We know how, re we know how lynchings worked in this country. Violent white people believed that the chaos and disorder they felt with the growing freedom of African Americans, they thought that that could be brought into order if they killed, if they lynched very gruesomely, black people. So if a black man or woman was upsetting the status quo for some slight, real or imagined, surely a lynching would put everything back in order, right? And it would serve as a deterrent for future chaos. The Equal Justice Initiative down in Alabama is seeking to honor victims of lynchings. Now, I'm going to play an odd piece of audio from Brian Stevenson. He's the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. He's a civil rights attorney. He's the subject of the movie Just Mercy that just came out, if you're familiar with that, in the book of the same title. The story that we're going to hear appeared on the radio program Fresh Air. It's about three minutes long. I'm going to show some images. We're going to scroll through some images that are directly related to this story. I invite you to hear it with me. ...story related to the museum. We've been doing this thing where we have people go to lynching sites and we have them collect soil from the lynching site and put it in a jar. And in our museum, we have hundreds of these jars of soil that were collected from lynching sites. We have the name of the lynching victim. We have the date of the lynching. And it's been really powerful to give people an opportunity to do something tangible, to do something uh, redemptive, to do something restorative. And people come and they go to these places. We give them a memo, and it's really powerful. And we had a middle-aged black woman come to one of our events, and she was nervous about going to a lynching site by herself. But after the meeting, she was sort of fired up. And we gave her the jar, we gave her the memo, she went out to this lynching site, which, is, which was in a pretty remote area. And uh, she got really nervous, but she decided to do it. She went to the place where the lynching took place. She was about to start digging when a truck drove by. And there was this white man in the truck who slowed down and stared at her. And then she said the truck stopped and turned around and drove back by, and the man stared at her some more. And then she said the truck stopped. And this big white guy got out and started walking toward her. She was very nervous. And we tell people that you don't have to explain what you're doing. If you want to say you're just getting dirt for your garden, feel free to say that. And that's what she intended to do. But when this white man walked up to her and he said, what are you doing? She said, something got a hold of me. And I turned to that man. I said, I'm digging soil because this is where a black man was lynched in 1931, and I'm going to honor his life. 
And she said she was so scared that she started digging real fast. And then the man stood there and he said, does that paper talk about the lynching? And she said, yes, it does. And then he said, can I read it? And she gave the man the paper and he stood there reading while she was digging. And then he put the paper down and stunned her by asking, would it be okay if I helped you? And then she told me that this white man got on his knees and she offered him the little plow to dig the soil. And he said, no, 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 you use that. And he started throwing his hands into the soil with such force. And his hands were getting coated with this black soil and they were turning black and he was putting them in the jar, but he kept throwing his hands and it moved her. And she said the next thing she knew, she had tears running down her face. And he stopped and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm upsetting you. And she said, no, 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 you're blessing me. And they kept putting the soil in the jar and they got the jar almost full and she noticed toward the end that the man was slowing down and that his shoulders were sag uh, shaking and she turned and she looked and she saw the man had tears running down his face and she stopped and she put his, her hand on this man's shoulder she said are you all right and that's when the man said to her he said no uh, I'm just so worried that it might have been my grandparents that were involved in lynching this man and she said they both sat there with tears running down their face and at the end of it he stood up and said, I want to take a picture of you holding the jar. And she said, I want to take a picture of you holding the jar. And they both took pictures holding the jar. And she brought this man back, and they put that jar on our exhibit together. Now, beautiful things like that don't always happen when you tell the truth about history, when you try to actually look for redemption and restoration, when you have every reason to be afraid and angry. But until we commit to some acts like that, until we tell the truth, we deny ourselves the beauty uh, of redemption. I encourage you to listen to the rest of that interview. We had to cut it for time today. Where's redemption found in this story? The man was worried that his grandparents had participated in this lynching. The myth of redemptive violence would have told us, well, by all means, his grandparents should have been violently retaliated against. If they had been, what would this man's response have been in that moment? Would it have been thrusting his hands, digging in the dirt, seeking salvation himself? Not likely. Stevenson points out something that I want to leave with you today. It's acts like this that bring about real redemption, that bring about real healing, that are part of Jesus' way. That's our call. That's who we are. And that's who we will continue to be. May it be so.